couple weeks ago, I think it was uh, December 18th, uh, well, what, was that last week? Man, just this, year, this month has just been kind of all over the place. Uh, we, we, I had a sermon prepared, and it was as the final in this long, in this series that we've been doing, talking about the gifts. We were talking about the gifts that the Magi, the wise men, brought to Jesus Christ, and our eyes were being opened to the spiritual significance of all these gifts. Uh, so we've been talking about it. We've been in Matthew 2.11 for like three weeks now, three or four weeks now, and so this will be the last of it, okay? So it kind of reminds me of a joke. Uh, one day, a pastor's wife, she and her husband, they were at home. She plopped herself down on a couch, and she goes, man, I'm so exhausted. And her husband, the pastor, he goes, you're exhausted. And he was a pastor of a large church. He goes, I preach three Christmas Eve services, and then I, this morning, I preach two Christmas Day services. Why are you so tired? She says, because I had to listen to every single one of them. So that you may kind of feel that way with today, but we're bringing this to a close, and we're going to try and get through it real quickly here and so we can get you out on time and not uh, be with your family and stuff. But praise the Lord. I'm glad to be here with you guys, your family, with me, and I appreciate you. So I want to talk about it. We talked about the Magi uh, and the gifts that they brought. The first gift we looked at was gold. Gold represented, the first week it represented he was king. Frankincense was the second gift that they brought, and it represented that he was our high priest, that Jesus was the high priest, and today we want to talk about myrrh. Some of the things we learned about the wise men quickly, number one, more than likely, there were more than three of them. There was probably an entourage of them with a small army that went in there, went in there to looking for the baby Jesus, following the star, and that's the reason why it caused Herod to be such a freaking out over the whole situation, going, what's going on? What's going on? And so he, that's why he acted the way he did. But there was a, probably a lot of them. The Magi were also, they were not king. We three kings of Orient all, or whatever that goes, whatever. I don't know what it says, but, <laughs> but it's, they probably weren't, they weren't kings. They were king makers, though. They were very wise. They are the ones who um, counseled the kings. They're the ones that gave advice to the kings. Kings sought out these wise men, the Magi, all over that ancient area, for advice on how to do things, and they also did all kinds of things in uh, giving advice to him. Uh, they did not show up the night that Jesus was born. He, they weren't there at the manger scene. More than likely, they were there two years later at Mary and Joseph's home, where the babe Jesus was when he was a young boy. So they showed up a lot later. And also the gifts that they brought. They were not only costly, they were not only expensive, but they were very prophetic. In other words, they showed the things that Jesus would be doing. Uh, like I said, gold represented that Jesus was our king. He is the king of kings, amen? He came down from earth and he's king. And he's going to, listen to me, he's going to come back. And he's going to rule this world. And I can't wait for his rule. It's going to be better than any president you've ever loved, okay? <laughs> I'm telling you right now, it's going to be better than any. He is God, he's king, and it is good to be underneath his rule. Hallelujah. And then also, they brought him frankincense. They, these wise men, they were priests in the Medo-Persian area. They were priests. They worshiped different things. And they brought this frankincense knowing that frankincense represented a priest. One of the things we learned about Jesus was this. He's our high priest. The high priest is the one that made the sacrifices for the people because the people couldn't go near to God. But Jesus... He intercedes for us. He sits at the right-hand side of the Father, still interceding for you and I today when we pray. we got a great high priest. And today, we're going to be looking at myrrh. And myrrh is one of those things, it's like, what in the world is myrrh? It's kind of like a strange Christmas gift. How many of you guys already opened up your Christmas presents this morning? Did you really? Wow, that's because you have kids, that's why. The rest of us are like, <sighs> so anyway... <laughs> You guys got up. How many of you guys have ever received a really strange Christmas gift? And you're thinking, ha, thank you. <laughs> Let's look at five different Christmas strange gifts up here, okay? Grass flip-flops. These are flip-flops. They're made and feel like... This is, these are actual gifts, by the way. And if you want some, or maybe you can... These are gift ideas for you the next year. You have grass flip-flops. The next one. How about this one? Uh, this one... <laughs> I love this one. The chainsaw carver. It's actually... <laughs> A meat carver that you can cut your bird with a chainsaw for all those uh, lumberjacks out there. The third one, the beard, beardaments. These are things that you can put on your beard for Christmas. That guy, look at him. He looks tough, okay? That's the only way you can make, that's the only look you can have if you're going to have those on your beard. Otherwise, people are going to make fun of you, all right? 
You making fun of my beard? So, all right, this one here, uh, this is true, okay? <laughs> this is a Star Trek baby wrap. The ears and eyebrows, they're extra. But anyway, <laughs> that's for the tricky nerd family that you have. And then the next one's probably my favorite one, and that's this one. It's the world's greatest mullet 2023 calendar. <laughs> Look at that. The mustache really sets it off. So anyway... So when we look at, go ahead, yeah, thank you very much, get rid of that. When we look at these gifts, we think, oh, that's great, you know. But then you look at the three gifts that the wise men brought Jesus. Gold, yeah, I, we like gold, Mary and Joseph probably said. Frankincense, well, that's unusual, but it's very expensive. And, and you know, I don't know if they realize the significance of it or not. Maybe they did, I don't know. But the high priest, but then myrrh. What in the world is myrrh? See, they knew what myrrh was, and we're going to get into that in just a little bit. And when they saw that myrrh, they probably thought, this is indeed a strange gift for our little baby. Uh, what we're going to do right now, we're going to read Matthew chapter 2, verse 1, and then we're going to skip down to verse 9 and read 2, 11. It says this, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, where is he who has been born the king of the Jews? I love that. For we have seen his star in the east, and we have come, and we've come to worship him. Skip down to verse 9. And when the wise men, after they just got through talking with the king, and the king was interrogating them, asking him questions about it, and after they got through, when they heard the king, they departed, the wise men did. And behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother. And they fell down and they worshipped him. And when they opened up their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Myrrh. What is myrrh? Myrrh is still used today. It's used throughout all human history and it's used for a variety of things. But again, it's still used today. Myrrh, like frankincense, was this gum resin. And it came from a small thorny tree, which I thought was very interesting because later on it kind of brought into what it, it represented to me anyway. But it came from a small a thorny tree, this little gum resin. It was very aromatic. It was very good. Myrrh comes from the Greek word smyrnin. Smyrnin. You guys recognize that name? That was the second city in John's letter to the seven cities, to the seven churches in Asia Minor. Smyrna. And how did Smyrna get its name? Because that was one of their major exports. They exported this, and that's how they got their name, was Smyrna, was from this particular uh, myrrh right there. And that was their chief export. Now, Smyrna was used. How was it used? I'm going to give you four ways it was used. Number one, it was used as a beauty treatment. Smyr uh, uh, myrrh was used as a beauty treatment. Esther and other women, when they were brought before the king, um, they had to go through this regiment. They had to go through this... I don't know what you call it, beautiful, beautification thing. But they, for a whole year, they had a spa. I know, I'm not thinking, I, I want to be a girl. But anyway, let's not talk about that. For a whole year, they were pampered. They were pampered. Listen, I'm not one of those preachers, okay? I want to make sure that my fly's open. I'm doing great. All right. <laughs> this is from last night. From those of you who have no idea what I'm talking about. So anyway, my family would not let it go. Terry, let it go right now. Here we go. It was used as a beauty treatment. Say beauty treatment. beauty treatment. All right. And Esther and all these women that were brought before the king, they had to go through this beautification. Let me read it to you. Before young women turn to come, before a young woman's turn came to go into the king Xerxes, she had to complete 12 months of beauty treatments prescribed for the women. Six months with the oil of myrrh. For six months, I don't know what they did, I don't know how they used it, but it was part of beautification. And six, with perfumes and cosmetics. This was the ultimate spa experience, and it lasted for one year. Myrrh. The second way it was used, besides beauty treatment, is also used as a perfume. It was used as a perfume, and it smelled very good. Uh, Psalms 45, I was talking about the priest, the myrrh. Uh, alloys and cassia were pu perfumed their robes. In other words, it made it smell really good. As a matter of fact, there's another place in the Bible, and it's in Proverbs, and it talks about this seductive woman trying to entice uh, these men off the street. 
uh, to come into her house when her husband was gone. She was, a prost- she was acting like a prostitute, but she would perfume her bed with myrrh. So myrrh had this beautiful smell to it, and it was very attractive to people who smelled it. The third thing it was used for, myrrh was used for as a painkiller. Matter of fact, it's still used today in some parts of the country for painkiller for the teeth. Mark 15, 23, and this is talking about when Jesus was up on the cross. Well, actually, no, I take that back. Right before he's getting ready to nail Jesus to the cross on the ground, right before he's getting ready to nail him, they were going to give him a mixture of this myrrh with some other stuff. I think it was wine. But anyway, they was going to give him this mixture to help deaden the pain. It says this in Mark 15, 23. They tried to give Jesus wine mixed with myrrh to dull the pain, but he would not take it. Listen, Jesus did not want his pain dulled. He wanted to experience it. He came for a purpose. And his purpose was to die on the cross, an agonizing death, yes, it was. But the purpose was so that he could take upon himself all the sins of the world. And he did not want to miss out on that experience in any way. And so he did not take this myrrh, which was meant as a painkiller in his life. And the fourth one, and this is the one that I want us to focus on today, and that is this. Myrrh was used to treat the bodies of those who have died. History tells us that this was the primary use of myrrh. Egyptians, they would use myrrh for, on the inside of the body as a, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, embalming. embalming, yes, embalming type fluid. And then the Jews, they used it on the outside with other stuff to cause to, to get rid of the smell. I don't know if it did other things as well, but they used it in preparing the bodies of the dead. John 13, I'm sorry, John 19, it says this. When Pilate gave permission, Joseph came and took the body of Jesus away after he died on the cross. Verse 39. With him came Nicodemus, the man who had come to Jesus at night, and he brought about 75 pounds of perfume ointment made from myrrh and aloes. Aloes. Uh, and that was, again, to treat the body of the dead. Now, in studying this, I found some things which I thought was interesting. If you don't mind, I just want to just kind of give them to you, and I thought it was really neat. The Hebrew word for myrrh is more. It comes from the root word moriah. You guys ever hear of Mount Moriah in the Bible? The root word for myrrh, which was used to care for the body of the dead person, it comes from the word more, which comes from the root word Moriah. Mount Moriah. If you look at it, it, when they say Mount Moriah, they're not just talking about one little peak. They're talking about a whole bunch of a group of peaks right there. So that was an area. And that's an area in Jerusalem that was very, very important. It was the very first uh, place where they built the temple, where Solomon built the temple unto God, where God would reside. That's one of the things. And also, before that, before they built the temple, way, way back, hundreds of years before, They used it, that's where Abraham took his son to offer him up as a sacrifice, as a test. That God says, take your son up to this mountain. And so he took his son up there. And as he took his son up there, he's ready to sacrifice his son. Rabbis associate uh, myrrh with sacrificial death, and especially the sacrifice of a father giving his son. So when they think myrrh, they think of a sacrificial death, and especially of a father giving his son. Now, check this out. And I, when I first read this and heard it, I thought, ah, oh, that can't be true. That's just some pastor making up a story. But it's true. Mount Moriah in that area is also where Jesus was sacrificed on the cross. The same place. may not have been the exact same hill, but it was in that same little region, the area that right there. The same area where God would sacrifice his son for the world's sins. You can't make this stuff up. That's our God working. That's our God behind everything. And years and years ago, eons ago, working and weaving for his perfect will in the lives of every one of us. You can trust God. You can trust God with your life because he'll take care of you. You may not understand what he's doing or how it's going to happen or when. Your God is at work for you if you're trusting him. Amen? Hallelujah. So it's the same area where God would sacrifice his son for the world's sins. The gift of myrrh was prophetic. So when they gave this gift to Mary and Joseph and baby Jesus, it was a prophetic gift of Jesus' death. That's just amazing. Um, And again, I think it's also interesting, myrrh comes from a thorny tree. They made that his crown out of a thorny plant or whatever it was and branches, and they would drive it into his scalp. 
it was, again, from that, maybe, maybe the same type of tree they used. I have no idea, but it was just very interesting to me. Now imagine Mary and Joseph. They get this gift. Gold, yes. Frankincense, yes. Myrrh, they knew what it was used mostly for. They knew what it was used for. It's going to be a place. How would Jesus save his people? It says this, and it's not going to be up on the screen there, and this is what the angel said to Mary. She will give birth to a son, and you shall name him Jesus. The Lord is salvation, for he will save his people from their sins. How was Jesus going to save his people from their sins? He was going to die. He was going to die through his death. And that's the next point. I don't know if I have it up there or not, but Jesus was born to die. I don't know if I have that point or not. I don't. I'm sorry. Jesus' teachings does not save us. Listen to me. We read the Bible, the things that Jesus said, the things he taught, the Beatitudes and all that stuff. His teachings is not what saves us. Jesus, the way he lived his life and his examples, that's not what saves us. It was the death of Jesus is what saves us. Jesus came for a purpose, and we talked about this last night. He was born to die. That was his main purpose in coming, taking on a human body. Remember, God is spirit. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. You cannot kill spirit. That's why Jesus had to take on a body. And he came as a child. And, you know, and, which is amazing to me again. Why didn't he just come in as a man and do it? You know what I'm saying? But yet he experienced everything. He couldn't experience this, the suffering. He couldn't experience the sorrows. He couldn't experience the life that everyone has had. He's going to be our high priest who is not unacquainted, uh, unacquainted with the sufferings that you and I go through. He knows the heartbreaks. He knows what makes you sad. He knows the things that makes you angry. He knows the temptations that we have. That's the great high priest. And the only way he could do that is if he started as a child and grew up with that all of his life. Guy can't experience it. Only Jesus could because Jesus is the one who took on the body. Amen? So Jesus took on a body so that he could die. Jesus' teachings didn't save us. His death did. And so we're saved. Listen, we're saved when we recognize that Jesus died for us. And we say, Lord, forgive me. I surrender my life to you. I believe what you did. And your belief requires action. Lots of times we just say believe. But I, I believe that belief because faith without works is dead. So our belief says, yes, I'm following you. I'm walking away from the old life. I'm following you. So, I love the Christmas story. I love the story where the angel visits the virgin, where the virgin becomes pregnant, where they have to go on a long journey to Bethlehem on that donkey like the one we had last night. And when they got there, there's no room for Jesus or anyone else in the inn. And that night, they, he slept with the animals, with the sheep, with the donkeys, and then his manger was a bed. But the reason Jesus was born was so that he could die for you and I. And this... This was the plan from the very beginning, even before the world. Listen to this, 1 Peter. For you know that it is not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you and I have been redeemed from the empty way of life that was handed down to us from our ancestors. No, but it was with the precious blood. Can we just, is verse 19 there? Let me just read that. Let's read this right here. I'm going to read it, and then we're going to pick up right here, and we're going to read on. It says, For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from this empty way of life that was handed down to you from your ancestors. Ready? But with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect, he was chosen before the creation of the world. That was the plan of God. Number one, he goes, I... I'm going to create people, and I'm going to create people to rule the things that I make. I'm going to create so I can have a relationship with them. They can have, actually, so they can have a relationship with me. God already has a great, perfect relationship. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. But God wanted things to enjoy him as well. That's your God. God doesn't just create us just to entertain him. We're not that entertaining to God. <laughs> but the thing is this. He, made, he created us so that we can experience his love. We can experience his grace, his power, his might, his wisdom. We were created to know our God. And God wanted us to know that. And the thing is, he also knew that we would fail him. But he had a plan to redeem us. And it was even before the creation of the world. And Jesus, you're the one who's going to take on the human body. And you're the one that's going to die. But you're also going to be the one I'm going to raise. And you're going to rule with my people forever and ever and ever and ever. Hallelujah.
So let's look at this verse one more time. Knowing all this, what does it say to you and I? When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. They got excited. They started shouting. They did the dance around the fire. I have no idea. They were excited. Exceedingly. Say exceedingly. Exceedingly. See, here in, in, in the States, we're much more sophisticated. Seriously, aren't we? I was like, oh, that was rather good. We, 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 we're the golf clappers. Shh, don't, don't show too much excitement. We are like that. I, I praise God. I, I want to use my, my excitement for God. And, and I, I want God and not you to tell me, settle down, Terry, okay? <laughs> so we just need to really surrender to God and trust him in all these things. And we need to rejoice. We need to worship him with sh- excitement, shouting, and joy as well. And when they had come into the house, when they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshiped him, and they opened up their treasures, and they presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. The Magi saw two things, and they did two things. Number one, they saw the star, and they rejoiced. They got excited. They got excited. They knew what God had planned. And they found what they were looking for, and they got excited. And then the second thing they saw was this. They saw the child. And what did they do then? They worshiped. They worshiped. They fell down on their face. These, these wise men, these very important men, the ones that kings look to for advice, they got on their face, and they worshiped a child, a child. So with closing, I have two questions for us. Jimmy, would you come on up, play some music for us? Um, each Christmas, we should have two responses. We should. Every Christmas, we should rejoice and say, God, thank you. In the world today, especially in Christian kingdom, so to speak, there was at one time, and I've had people come up to me, ah, we don't celebrate Christmas. That's a pagan holiday. That was actually taken from pagans. That is a bunch of bunk, and that's the most polite way I can put it. You know, lots of times throughout history, all over the world, we hear people say, Christianity stole from this religion. Christianity stole from that religion. They make these claims without any proof whatsoever, and they throw out these uh, uh, internet infidels type post, which was a bunch of bunk. Can I just say it? It's a lie. It's a lie. We celebrate Christmas. Yes, it got commercialized. But the thing is this, we celebrate Christmas because we rejoice in the fact that God came to save us. Can we rejoice over that? God came to save us. Amen. Yes. We rejoice in the fact that God sent Jesus and he planned us a long time ago. And he was just waiting for Terry to be born so Terry would accept him. Amen? He's waiting for you to be born so that you would accept him. And you would surrender your life. And your children as well. So we should rejoice. So how should we respond at Christmas time? With rejoice. And and what gifts should we give Jesus? What kind of gifts should we give Jesus? Gold, frankincense, myrrh. How about the fourth gift that actually the wise men gave? Gold, frankincense, myrrh, and worship. They gave worship. They gave worship. We can give what the Magi gave, worship. Um, And by the way, they worshiped specifically Jesus. They didn't worship some higher power or just some God out there. They worshiped the specific person. And we need to know this today, church, because Jesus, the name of Jesus is under attack. And so I'm proud to stand with Jesus. Hallelujah. And they specifically worship the name of Jesus. And by the way, their worship was costly. They brought some very things. And I want to give three quick things how we can have true worship of Jesus, and it will cost us something. Let me say that again. Listen to me. When you worship Jesus, it should cost you something. It should cost me something. We don't just come and just say, hallelujah, thank you, raise your hand, and walk away. Worship should cost us something. I want to give you three ways that you can really worship God. Um, Martin Luther said that there's, uh, well, the first thing that should cost us, let's go to the first one. Our worship should cost us financially. Yeah, it should cost us money. It should cost us a lot. It, it, it cost these wise men a lot because they took a long trip. And for that long trip and with all those people and with the small army they took with them to watch over them and all these guys and all the animals and all the servants because these are wise men. These are magi. They're important people. It cost a lot of money to move all these people however far they went. And they traveled a long ways. It cost them a lot of money in that. It cost them in their gold. 
Gold's not cheap, amen? <laughs> Frankincense, it was not cheap. Myrrh, it was not cheap. Martin Luther, he said this, there are three conversions that's necessary for a Christian life. The first conversion has to be your heart. The second conversion is your mind, what you understand. And the third conversion is your purse, your pocketbook. That shows you where your heart is. So when we say, Lord, I want to serve you. And I, look, I'm not saying this so we have bigger offerings. I'm not saying this. This is fact. This is truth. And if I don't preach it, I'm robbing all of us of the truth that God wants us to gr comprehend and grasp. Amen? And so, the purse. King David, when he was uh, offering a sacrifice, God told him, I says, I want you to go and sacrifice over here so that I can stop this plague that's happening over my people Israel. So King David went to this place, and uh, when he went there... Um, the guy who owned the land, he says, uh, King David says, hey, I want to buy your land, and I want to buy this in here so that I can offer a sacrifice to God. And the guy says, no way, you can have it free, it's yours. I want, I want to worship God too, but it's yours, King David. And King David said this, I will not worship God with that that costs me nothing. I'm not just going to give him nothing, I'm going to have it come from me. True worship costs us, and it costs us in our pocketbook. Um, Second thing it costs us, our worship should cost us our dignity. Say dignity. 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 The Magi, they bowed down. Some of the most important people of the time, they got on their face in front of a little baby. No one else knew that he was king, but they did. And they didn't care what anyone else was doing. Can you imagine the neighbors going, what's going on over there? What's that big crowd of people going over there? Look, they went into Mary's house. What? They're on the ground in front of them. They're laying down. These guys didn't care what the world thought of them. They laid down before the king. They bowed before the king. Um, you know, again, they're important people. It's kind of like uh, if you and I choose not to worship God, it's kind of like this. It's kind of like, because the reason why people don't bow down to God is because they're proud. They, that's, let's just name it what it is. They're proud. And God resists the proud. But he lifts up the humble. But when we just say, I'm not going to worship God, it's kind of like a, a, a person who takes crayons and draws something, and now they're standing next to the Picasso painting, and they're thinking their, painting, their drawing is just as good. You know what I'm saying? That was a dumb analogy, wasn't it? But anyway, <laughs> we should humble ourselves. It should cost us our dignity. If you want to worship, consider giving up your dignity. Number one, it's undignified for people to raise their hands to God. If you find it hard to do that, then the Bible is full of it. Lifting up your hands to heaven, lifting up your hands to God and worshiping Him. If something is wrong, you might want to say, Lord, check my heart. Lord, I've got pride. There's something wrong there. How about this? Undignified. It's very undignified to get on your knees before God. I love it. The men, uh, we've been coming together and we've been praying. We've been getting on our knees. We've been laying out on the floor. We, we, we're hungry for God. We're hungry for God. And because we're hungry for God, we don't care how we look. Men are crying. Um, yeah, I know. I, I cry all the time, but I don't want to. <laughs> I don't. But the thing is, I cry all the time. But men cry. That's undignified for a man. It's undignified for uh, boys. I'm telling you right now, we need to consider giving up our dignity. It should cost us our dignity. And undignified also is thanking God out loud. Oh, they'll hear me. You know, I, I don't want to do that. I'll just be quiet. I'll just, I'll, I'll watch. Watching is not worshiping. Say that with me. Watching is not worshiping. All right. I labored that enough. So, standing still, folding your arms, looking around is not worshiping. Amen? Honestly, do we know that? So, if you really want to worship God, it's going to cost you something. It costs you your money. It's going to cost you your dignity. And the third thing is this. It can cost you relationally. Some of you guys have already experienced that. I've decided to follow specifically Jesus. Specifically Jesus. And because of that, you are going to be rejected either by your family, your coworkers, your friends, or a combination or all of them thereof. It will. If you are truly going to worship God, expect resistance. Expect those because they don't understand. They've been blinded. And some of them just have a hard, hard heart and they don't want anything to do with God. But you... You're going to worship God. Uh, I want to read this one more scripture here, and I'm done. And worship team, would you please come up? We're going to go out with one more song. It says, God blesses you when people mock you, and then they persecute you, and they lie about you, and they say all sorts of evil things about you because you are my followers. See, that's what's going to happen. 
especially in these end times. It's going to get much, much uglier for those who follow Jesus. It really, really will. I'm just, I don't say that to just a scare. I don't say that. I say that so that you will be firm in your faith and you're standing on the rock. Well, then I'm not going to change. I need to draw closer to God. I can't just grit my teeth, but I'm going to draw closer to God. I'm going to surrender true worship and everything about me. And when you do that, you're going to, and when the waves come and the world just crashes against you and beats against you, you're going to stand on Jesus Christ, the only thing that's going to save you for all eternity. Amen? So that's why we say that. That's why we keep beating that drum again and again and again. Yes, the world's going to be so against God, so against Jesus. So we have to be prepared for that. I want to read that one more time. God blesses you when people mock you. He blesses you. And, and when they persecute you, when they lie about you, and they see all sorts of evil things about you because you, why? Because you're my follower, says Jesus. I want you to be happy about it. <laughs> be very glad for a great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember, the ancient prophets, they were persecuted in the same way. So be prepared for that. I mean, I'm not looking forward to that. It's like, all right, bring it on today. I, I'm not looking for that, okay? I'm going to be, you know, oh, please. But the thing is, when it comes down to it, no. I stand with the one who died for me. I stand with the one who's my salvation. I stand with the one who loves me enough to have done that and planned it a long time ago. Will you stand with me? Will you stand with me? Don't let me stand alone. They need, some, they need someone to stand up. They need someone to lead with confidence. And that's what we need to do. And when they see you doing that, then that might just give them the push to do the same. But get ready to do it alone. Amen? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. What we're going to do right now, we're going to have communion. And uh, you guys are going to serve yourselves. We're gonna, since there's a few of us here today, we're going to do it rather quickly. So go ahead and stand to your feet. <clears throat> we have three tables up here, so we do it quickly. We have two tables back there. And listen, let me say this to you. If you are not a follower of Jesus Christ, don't take this. Because this, you're identifying, I belong to Jesus. With this, you're saying, I identify with the death of Jesus Christ because I've also died to myself and Jesus has raised me back. This is what this represents. I belong to Jesus. So, Heavenly Father, I thank you today. And Lord, we just ask that you search our hearts. Thank you for this day, this Christmas day, the day you've made. I thank you, Lord God, for the opportunity to be here with other believers to worship you. Lord, may that, those three things of worship, our finances, our dignity, and relationships, may they always be there and we know about it. You are worth it. Amen. You are worth it, Father. You're worth it, Jesus. And I thank you, Lord, for that. Today, Lord God, as we receive this communion, I just pray for your presence to be very real throughout this whole day. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, grab this. Don't take it. Just hold on to it, and we'll take it together. Go ahead. Come forward. Go backwards. Whatever. Let's go ahead and stand. 
Lord, thank you. We lift up our hands and our face towards heaven. We worship you. Worthy are the Lord God Almighty. Worthy are you, Lord God, who planned this a long time ago before the world was even created. Lord, you saw us. You loved us. And you made the way. Where a way we could not make it, you made the way. And you did it with your body. Thank you, Jesus, for coming to earth. Thank you, Jesus, for taking on being a man and also God. Thank you for living, experiencing, suffering, dying. Lord, that's what this is all about. You gave your life for us. I thank you for your body, Lord God, that was broken for every one of us. And we remember what you've done and we receive it right now. So go ahead and eat the bread. And Lord, as we learned last night, there can be no forgiveness of sin without the shedding of blood. You shed your blood for us, Father. That you shed your blood for us, Jesus. You shed your blood for us. And we thank you. And now because of that, we believe and we are saved. We are made perfect. We are not perfect. You are perfect. Your perfect has been applied to our lives. So when God the Father sees us. He sees the blood of Jesus, the perfect Lamb of God. And our sins are cleansed. They are taken away from us as far as the east is, is from the west. Our God has removed our sins from us as well because of the blood of Jesus. So, Lord, we receive that right now. Amen. Hallelujah. All right. Now we're going to go out rejoicing with one more song here.
share your blessings everywhere we go and you are the greatest blessing of all. Lord, I pray your blessings as we walk out of this place uh, uh, just, Lord, you go before us, behind us, all around us, you protect us, Lord God. Lord, as we meet with our families, Lord, that the opportunity to, to share you and to talk about the goodness of our God, may that come up in the conversations. Thank you, God. Uh, we're looking forward to see what you're doing in Jesus' name. Amen. Merry Christmas, church. Merry Christmas. God bless you. Pick a fast song.